Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is John Bailey. I'm a fellow at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and also a Walton Family Found, uh, Foundation fellow. I'm going to be your moderator today. We're going to be talking a little bit about the Trump administration. What does it mean uh, for K-12 education, higher education, workforce training? A lot of the issues that we've been talking about here. And, uh, and we're going to build off of what the secretary commented on earlier. So we'll talk. We have a great panel. Uh, to my right, your left, we have Michael Sorrell, who's the president of Paul Quinn College, uh, doing some really innovative things. Lauren Maddox, who's the principal of the Podesta Group. Uh, Lauren and I had the chance to work together in the Bush administration. She was also uh, one of the folks that was helping uh, Betsy during confirmation hearings and has been active on uh, a number of education issues over uh, the last couple of years. Allison Griffin, uh, who's the senior vice president of government relations at Strata Education. Uh, and has been doing a lot of innovative work that you just heard on the panel before. Uh, she's going to be talking to us a little bit more about higher education. We have Ben uh, Wallerstein, who's the co-founder of Whiteboard Advisors, a uh, good friend to many of you here. He's working with investors and philanthropists and uh, entrepreneurs and helping them understand uh, the regulatory headwinds and tailwinds as it relates to the startup ecosystem and uh, a lot of the work that you all are doing. And then we also have Senator Mike Johnston from Colorado, uh, who has been uh, leading on education in Colorado in a number of different roles, uh, from principal of a school, uh, the President Obama helped, uh, uh, featured and, and highlighted, uh, and he's been a, a leader in the Senate there, and he's running for governor now uh, in, in, uh, in Colorado as well. So we'll be talking about that. So. You know, let's jump right in. You know, Panos, you, you heard the secretary talk, and one of, the, one of the things she said at the beginning is that the system is broken, it's antiquated, and it's unjust. So do you agree? Well, I mean, everybody was looking like, who wants to go first? Who wants um, to go first? I think without question, the system is broken. Um, I think we can look at the number of students that are struggling that aren't being successful, aren't making it through it, and recognize that there are things that we need to do better. The question becomes, how do you get better? And then the other question is standing to do better, right? I mean, do you have the standing? Do you have the familiarity? Do you have the necessary worldview and perspective um, to understand how to make the shift necessary to create change? So I would say that there are parts of the system that are antiquated. I think you know, when we think about the current student, at least in the higher ed space, um, recognizing that we no longer have the majority of students who attend full time, you know, living on campus in that 18 to 22 year old um, age range, and a lot of our systems are set up to serve that student, I think that there are a lot of changes that could be made to address the current student population. And I think there's a... I think in many ways it's, it's more broken than we, th we think, and it's broken in ways that we don't often, often um, spend a lot of time thinking about. So, so if the NCLB era was rooted in sort of assessment and performance management tools, and the uh, Obama era was sort of centered on college access and completion, um, there's still this question about whether we're, we're relying on old proxies or the wrong, wrong proxies, right? So if the, if the system of pub public education or our system of education is designed to cultivate social and economic mobility and we question the relevance or value of a college degree in, in stimulating social and economic mobility, are we, are we even focused on the right things to begin with and the right proxies to orient the system? What's, what's true north? if the goal is social and economic mobility. And I don't think we have real clarity around some of those really fundamental issues. I would just say we wouldn't all be here at this really great conference if we thought things were going really well. And so I think there's uh, uh, a lot of room for improvement. And I think even with the Every Student Succeeds Act, I think we have a great opportunity with really great state leaders to make some changes that I think are necessary. So. Yeah, I think the system is antiquated, so what do we need to do to fix it? But I just want to build off a point you made about, you know, the system and the, are, are we measuring the right thing? And that's, this seems to be a debate right now in all of education uh, in trying to help gauge higher education's impact and quality with gainful employment, which was a very controversial sort of debate and still ongoing. In K-12, we have debates around uh, our standardized assessments, and now with with ESSA, states are putting in plans, they're wrestling with what other indicators do they use. So uh, for the panel, what are, what are some other indicators that we should use to help gauge uh, equity and student achievement and if we're helping kids reach their full potential? 
I think, I think uh, we can. I think we can measure social and economic mobility in the UK, where there's been a um, a shift towards skills-based hiring, which we really haven't seen here in the in the states. They are they are looking at longitudinal measures of social and economic mobility. They're looking at wage growth over time. And again, if that's um, that, that, that could be a, a, f a flawed proxy or a, f a flawed set of data to consider as well. Um, but I was inspired and drawn into working in education because I saw education as a lever for social mobility and economic mobility. I think a lot of people see education as sort of a, a mega issue or a transcendent policy area that can have a profound impact in all sorts of other areas. Um, and so I think we have to start to look at some of those uh, those other data points. I think the data is increasingly there. Higher education is becoming more and more interested in data. The field of, of predictive analytics, um, is, it, while nascent, is, is yielding really profound results. And so um, I think we need to be willing to challenge ourselves to look at data that we don't typically think about in terms of holding institutions and systems accountable. You know, I, I think it's interesting. Um, the space that we operate in at Paul Quinn, we take students from urban America, and they are students who have been in some of the more academically and socially and socioeconomic, most difficult spaces you can be in. And what we are telling them is, you have the opportunity to transform your community, right? That it has to be about something bigger than just yourself. And, and then we challenge them and we say, look, if you were going to create a community you wanted to live in, what would that look like? One of the things we did, you know, we terminated our football program. We turned our football field into a farm to battle in a food desert and with the students and said, look, do something, right? So I would submit, in terms of measuring socioeconomic indicators, why don't we take a look at how the communities that have produced these students begin to change, right? Because what we're seeing is they're not changing. Mm -hmm. right? So clearly we're failing in some kind of way because the students are continuing generation after generation to live in substandard environments. I think it would be interesting to take a look at a holistic picture yeah. and say part of the way we'll know if we're successful is if students stop living in these conditions. It's a different way of looking at it, yeah. but I think we're at a point where we're going to have to look at things from a different lens. Allison, you've, you've uh, I know with, with Strata and with um, a number of the different projects you're involved in has been exploring a lot about the student voice and how to capture students. And you know, it's, it's interesting, you go to a lot of conferences, there's always you know, teachers and entrepreneurs and investors and funders, but you know, rarely do we really sort of capture the student voice. But how, how are you going about that? And how should that factor into both education policy as well as you know, practice down at the local level? Absolutely. So for anyone who was just, just joined us for the last session, you heard directly from Brandon Bustide with the Gallup organization. Strata has a partnership with Gallup um, focused on collecting interviews from 350 US adults every day. I'm um, asking them questions about their higher education experiences, perceptions, um, you know, what they may have done better or what they would have done differently if they had it to do all over again. Um, and for the first time, we are sort of unearthing the consumer voice, that student voice, um, and using that information um, to guide solutions, innovative practices, policy. Um, to date, we've collected 100,000 interviews from US adults. And so when you think about the power of that data set, it's a really unique data set that's going to help frame conversations from this point forward. Um, we'll be releasing our first report on June 1st um, in a couple of weeks. And um, you can follow along. It's uh, called the Education Consumer Pulse. And it'll be a series of reports over the next two to three years that will um, elevate the consumer perspective in education. It's fantastic. Um, what I, so let's, uh, to quote a phrase from Hamilton, let's get back to politics. So uh, have you seen Hamilton? No? OK. Uh, I want to sort of talk a little bit about uh, the, the way Michael and Deborah sort of set up this conference is about gravitational shifts. And uh, let's go back to sort of the, the Trump administration and, and Trump being swept into office. Is this a gravitational shift in policy, or is this just politics? Or is there something else at play here? <laughs> Phone a friend. We've got one politician. Um, that's right. I mean, I think the, 
With reference to this conference and this conversation, I think the question is, is there a dramatic shift around what the role of education is and what the role around the federal education department is? I think it's, you know, it's a valid time to ask the question, all right, if you go back 60 years to when LBJ founded the federal department, what was the role, right? And the role he described was this is about kind of building a bridge between, between hopelessness and hope, right? It's about how do you essentially create a department whose job is to serve those kids that are the least well served across the country. That meant Title I for kids who were in low income communities. It meant kids who were speak, spoke a different language. Yes, kids who were from a different country, kids who had additional needs. And how do we put a federal insurance policy to make sure every one of those kids are served well? I think the biggest risk raised right now by this administration is what you're seeing is a retreat from all those populations. So what you're seeing is a proposed $4 billion cut to Pell Grants at the very time when access to higher ed is at its greatest risk in a generation, right? You see a $1.2 billion cut of zeroing out of all the after school community centers like the one that ran out of my office in Denver that makes sure low income kids can get access to healthy food after school and get social programs. You see potentially a 30% cut to the entire department budget to fund the voucher expansion, which would mean 30% cuts to everything from Title I to ELL. I mean, those are all the services that were at the core of what we thought the federal role in education meant. And if you take out that insurance on protecting the kids that need us most, I think the question is, what does the federal department be become? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's a role we want to walk down, is to say, we're going to pull back the protections from kids that need us the most. I think that was, whatever the criticisms, one of the great strengths of the Obama administration was a deep commitment to those protections. I think the, answer to the question to answer now is, where are those protections going to come from, if not from leadership at the federal level? And that's where I think so much will be left now to states and to districts to backfill costs they probably can't carry right now. So I would say that there was an element of the election that was about the size and scope of the federal government. So the education department is one of the smallest uh, agencies, and it's about to get smaller. Um, and uh, I think that is, there's an effort underway through the Office of Management and Budget to tell all agencies to take a look um, at, the, at your departments, your personnel, uh, the functions, and um, are they necessary, are, you know, can we do without, et cetera, but still meet the mission of that agency. Um, so I think you're, you're going to see a, a shift. I would just say, though, you referenced the president's skinny budget. Um, we're going to see a, a more comprehensive budget come out uh, later on this month. And I think, um, as was reported, it was essentially dead on arrival on Capitol Hill. There's no way that the president's going to get $54 billion additional in defense dollars, and it, he's going to take it out of uh, non-defense discretionary programs. It's just not going to happen. And it was the same way with President Obama's budgets. You know, he, he I think he, they had a vote a couple of times, as I recall, and he got no votes um, from either party on the budget. So it's informative. It's insightful, um, but it's, uh, there's going to be a lot of give and take uh, with the Congress. In fact, just this week, the Congress did do something in a bipartisan way, which is pass the fiscal year 17 uh, spending bill. Okay, it was seven months late, but um, at least they got it done. They did it in a bipartisan way, and they restored Pell, Summer Pell. Um, uh, they actually added money to the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program. So again, Congress appropriates the money. The president can make suggestions, but uh, again, we're gonna, you know, it's gonna be wait and see what he comes out with in a couple of weeks. But anyway. So but actually, oh, oh, I was just gonna say, I think what we have to be careful not to allow to get lost is intent, right? Um, because the intent is to do things that to the, to the senator's, I was about to call you the governor's standpoint, <laughs> so we're going to speak it into existence. Um, but there are, I mean, our federal agencies bloated. I mean, we know they're bloated, right? But it doesn't mean that there aren't some really key and critical fundamental services that are needed. And what makes people nervous is when you start talking about states' rights, mm -hmm. you know, that's coded language to some of us, right? And states' rights haven't always served us well. And so when you then look at that and you look at the fact that 30 plus le state legislatures are in the hands of folks that are trying to roll back voting rights acts, well then what are we really saying, right? And, and so I think we, we can take assurance that, you know, there's only so far things can move, but you cannot underestimate the damage mm -hmm. that the attempt does and the message that that sends. Yeah, that, so that builds on a question kind of that I, that I wanted to 
build on with Lauren too, that, that with the budget, because I mean, you pointed out that the skinny budget was almost dead on arrival the moment it, it you know, Congress took a look at it and said, thanks, we'll consider this, and then pretty much just it was a repudiation of the budget when they, they passed the omnibus this year. But, but so, like, is that just a, another sign of dysfunction at the federal government level, uh, or is this checks and balances working? And does that even matter because of the intent? Like, does it distract and sort of the conversation and, and stoking the fears and anxieties of people? I mean, you know, I think at the end of the day, you lead from the middle, right? That you have to find a way to speak languages that appeal to all of us, that unite us, that bring us together. Now, to your point, there were a lot of really unhappy people who had felt ignored and marginalized. That is a recipe for disaster on either extreme, right? Because those folks should have never been made to feel unwelcome in their own country, right? That's not acceptable. But then it's not acceptable to then turn around and do to others what it was done to them, right? Like you have to find a way to build a common language and find common goals and ambitions. And I just think that that is where we're going, all of us are gonna have to work to help push things because it's not gonna do anyone any good that you have four years of group of people who felt marginalized for eight and they feel ecstatic. And then you've got this group over here who are really angry and inspired and ready to resist at all costs. That's, that's not how you create a country that really is healthy and, and strong. So where are some areas that are potential areas of common ground? Where, where could we build sort of a middle coalition, uh, either K-12, pre-K, higher education, job training? Where, it uh, doesn't have to be specific programs, but what would be some specific issues that, you, that you're particularly hopeful around? I think there are a couple of things that we could consider. Um, I think you know, there's room for regulatory reform and easing some of the regulatory burden on institutions and um, you know, whether they be higher education institutions or K through 12 schools to allow for more innovation and creativity by teachers, by administrators, um, I think that there's also room for looking at new models of teaching and learning, you know, around competency-based education, um, meeting students where they are in the classroom, um, and then also some ideas around innovative financing and how, you know, how students and families can actually pay for college, maybe outside the scope of the federal student loan program, looking at other ways um, to help families um, acquire resource to get their student through school. Any other ideas? I think that's right. I mean, we, we, um, we've been focused a lot on, and, and there, there are a handful of bills focused on income sharing agreements. So an area that um, uh, Mitch Daniels has focused on at Purdue with the Back of Boiler program, there's, there's been bipartisan legislation designed to clarify the tax treatment of income sharing agreements. Um, income sharing agreements for the most part are replacing um, certain private student loan vehicles, and I think those um, that, you know, that's an area that has potential in a profound way to affect college access. Um, it creates a mechanism for institutions of higher education to have some more skin in the game. Um, it doesn't seem to draw the same uh, levels of political antipathy as other, as other approaches do. So I, I do think there are areas at the, there, there are some areas where, the, where there are real opportunities for common ground. And I would just add that in higher education, there's some wonderful innovations taking place. And I think having a greater amount of freedom to bring them to the marketplace, um, to experiment where the cost of experimentation isn't quite so drastic. I mean, I thought Mayor Fenty said something really interesting about the culture of you know, technology in Silicon Valley is that folks aren't afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, in higher ed for many years, you are punished so severely from failing that it discouraged people from really trying to bring new things to the market. Uh, I think there's real value in having the freedom to bring things to the market, even if they aren't all successful. Right. Yeah, it seems like that's a, that's a crucial area of how do you create the regulatory space and room for innovation, yeah. higher education. And I know that there's been experimentations with Equip to try to help with code academies. And uh, you know, I, I know there's efforts to try to look at that in K-12 uh, charter schools to some degree uh, could be in that as well. Yeah. 
Uh, are, are charters an area? Like, I, I know the, the choice debate very quickly galvanizes over into uh, vouchers and tax credits or, uh, you know, just funding for, for, but there's like a whole spectrum of choices. Is charters an area that can get some common ground or is that, is that become too, too challenging uh, as well? <laughs> I think it <laughs> there should be someone to the right of me. So I, can... <laughs> um, I, I think it could be um, an area of collaboration, but this is where I think intent matters. I think if you came out and led with a coalition that says, we think we want to provide meaningful public school choice and help build infrastructures and systems that do that, that make transportation possible to get kids to the schools they want to go to, that make sure there really are meaningful choices in each neighborhood, that make sure we're, that those choices are high quality, that we're not just opening a school because someone wants to open it and there's no way to close it after because the initial promise of charters was sort of more autonomy and more accountability, right? You have to have the second half of that commitment also, right. which is if you're low performing, we ought to be able to close you. So, but I think what we've found in Colorado, I think we've made that commitment, which is we took folks on the right and folks on the left who weren't sure about the school choice idea, and they came together with a common plan to say, let's support public school choice in an aggressive way. And I think we've built a really great system now. Almost 11% of the kids in the state are in charters, um, and there is some meaningful choice in all parts of the state. But I think if you, if you cannibalize that coalition and instead say, we're going to build one coalition here that's going to work on vouchers and one coalition here that's going to fight that, what you do is lose the chance for common productive progress around a shared value system and end up fighting over where people were, I thought, 20 years ago. So I, I don't want to see us go back to that old battle. I'd like to see us focus, because there's plenty of work to be done on how do we improve the diversity of the charter models that are available and make sure that their quality is high and make sure that their reach is significant. Uh, I think we're doing that in Colorado. I don't want to see that distracted by a sort of federal agenda in the opposite direction. You, you mentioned accountability, and right now, you know, we're going through a, a bit of an experimentation as like states are wrestling with what should new accountability systems look like for K-12, for charter schools, you know, all in the context of the, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And we just had the first batch of states that submitted their plans to the department for approval, but you know, I'm just kind of curious, just your impressions, are you, um, energized by what you're seeing states putting forward? Are they losing too much of the guardrails that the senator mentioned? Or are you seeing some innovation in terms of how states are thinking about accountability? Student voice? I think you're seeing the seeds of innovation, right? And, and I, I think states are, are understandably cautious. And I think that, but, I, but that has very little to do with, uh, I think the, the, the planning process around S implementation and the plans that states submitted, I think didn't, didn't factor in uh, a Trump administration in a, in a profound way. I mean, the, the, the planning processes were in place well in advance. Um, when, I, when I say seeds of innovation, um, if you look at assessment, for example, you know, states are forced to keep two sets of books, right? They have, they have uh, statewide large-scale assessments, right, which are, which are compliance-driven. They're mandated by the feds. You have, you know, they, they, they are, um, evaluated by, by psychometricians. And then, and then states and districts oftentimes um, have a separate set of books, which are really decision support tools. It's data that's produced from reading or mathematics intervention products, from formative assessments that's producing data um, uh, that, 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 that has utility in, in, in driving strategy, district strategy, state strategy, and instructional strategy in, in, in the classroom. And, um, and in 2007, we had, we had growth model pilots. You had states like Utah, which, were, um, which, which, which had a statewide systems of formative assessment, um, but were nevertheless required to also do uh, state-level high-stakes assessment. So, what, so the elimination or the opportunity um, to, to derive data from a set of technology tools, formative and observational assessments, intervention products, uh, to aggregate that data and provide something that both has utility as a decision support tool to inform strategy and um, is sufficient for compliance purposes to ensure that the federal government is getting a, a, re a return on its investment, um, uh, I think is, is really quite profound. We're seeing the seeds of that today. We, we, we think about it, uh, we, we refer to it um, within our team oftentimes as invisible assessment. Um, how can we capture data as a byproduct of the things that we're doing that has that can serve dual purposes? And, and, and again, I think you're seeing the seeds of that in, in SF, uh, state plans. My worry is um, the opposite, which is there is a desire when you get um, a 
diagnosis from the doctor to just pretend you didn't get it, right? Which is, and the idea of not knowing that you're sick doesn't make you well. Uh, and I think my fear is there are folks who haven't liked the set of transparency and accountability that we put in place over the last decade because it has revealed real gaps even within some of our wealthier school districts, right? So you might think, oh, well, if you just get to the suburbs and go to XYZ district, your kids are gonna be great. Well, until you look at the disparities and see actually low-income kids and kids of color are doing worse in those suburban districts than they are in the urban districts that they were fleeing from. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of folks who'd rather have some of that data go away. Uh, and I think that's not gonna be helpful to any of us. So I think we should keep a close eye on, this was why you had the push for a common set of standards in the first place, right? Because when you can design your own standards, and design your own assessment, every state can say we're first in the, in the, in the world because we have an 80% pass rate on a test that requires you to put your name and address on it. Um, and so I think we really wanna watch to say, do states not take advantage of this to try to roll back some of the transparency and meaningful, comparable data you'll have to show what's working that allows us to improve? So, but, uh, Senator, you, you had a good, you were talking a little bit about the pendulum that sometimes, you know, these reauthorizations overcompensate for the perceived or real faults of the previous, right? So, every reauthorization is always seen in the context of what were usually sort of the, the rough edges of the previous one. So, the NCLB, you know, sort of gave us ESEA uh, or, uh, waivers and now uh, ESSA. But on higher education, uh, so the, the, the secretary said we shouldn't do a reauthorization. We should just start from scratch. So that's option A. Uh, option B is it sounds like um, uh, the Congress may also be working on a reauthorization. What, what should Congress be doing? Should they just rebuild it from scratch? Should they do, what do you hope they can do in uh, reauthorization to kind of help with the innovation that we've been seeing at the conference this week? I mean, from my perspective, um, you know, actually as a former Hill staffer, there were times when we would say, yes, let's scratch the whole thing and start over, um, because it is an unwieldy in some um, particular areas of the law um, and almost overly complex. Um, but I think that uh, to be very realistic, um, I, I, you can't, I mean, you can't completely wipe the slate clean and start over. But I think you can begin to think about how do we simplify and streamline um, some of the complexity that has made its way into the statute over the last you know, 50 plus years that has actually created um, challenges for students to move through the higher education system. The Higher Education Act obviously written at a time when the student body looked very different. Um, and although it's been reauthorized over you know, a number of decades, um, the policies in place do not fit the current student population. So um, I think that there are opportunities for key stakeholders to come together, um, collaborate on some uh, new approaches. Um, but I will agree with the secretary um, earlier when she said, you know, the, the opportunity to voice those opinions and ideas um, to your congressional representatives and quite frankly, more importantly, their staff. Um, who are the ones working behind the scenes um, to make all of this happen um, is so critically important. And it's important for people to have a voice and to be active in the policy making process. So I would just say, you know, they are working on some text. We understand we're gonna see something out of the Senate probably later this year to reauthorize Higher Education Act. Um, but in contrast to the Every Student Succeeds Act, so it was eligible in 2007 for reauthorization. It didn't happen until the end of 2015. So, and I think during that time, even the waiver process that Secretary Duncan um, used actually uh, served as a catalyst to create the public demand. You know, states were begging the Congress to reauthorize this law to give them a different, you know, uh, set of um, law, uh, just a different law and a different set of guidelines. So um, there was a lot of pressure, and I don't know whether that public demand exists right now to reauthorize. So uh, HEA has been eligible since the end of 2013, so I don't know whether it'll happen this Congress. Um, also, there, you know, it's a good relationship, I think, between Chairman Alexander and um, Senator Patty Murray. I think it, things are a little, still a little tense coming off of the confirmation of Secretary DeVos, but I think they'll come back together and they'll um, they're both very good sort of deal makers, uh, good thinkers, very thoughtful, great in this space. So I think they will come together. I just don't know whether it'll happen uh, this Congress. But I, I think you do also need to create that public demand sometimes in order for Congress to act. So. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think this may be unpopular, including with many of our clients, but 
that's okay. The, the, the um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure, um, like if there's one takeaway from, the, from, this, from this event, right, the, um, higher education is undergoing massive transformation, right? Um, the, 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 the landscape of, of participants um, in the sector is, 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 is perhaps more diverse than ever. The, the lexicon that we use to describe types of institutions and programs, we just wrote a paper on competency-based education. People love to talk about competency-based education. 800 institutions are in the process of launching competency-based education programs, but they're all really different. There's tremendous variability among competency-based education programs. Um, you know, Equip was a, was a really sort of fascinating experiment, but it's an experiment, it's an in part, an, an experiment in evaluation in, of, of programs and, and, and thinking through what metrics matter and how we should evaluate the quality of these programs. Um, so to the extent that uh, uh, we, we tend to calcify uh, processes around, around policies, it, in, in some ways it feels like it would be a shame to, to reauthorize the Higher Education Act today because I think things are really still shaking out in the, in the market. Yeah, I would agree. You know, and uh, with Ben, I think that's a great observation. In fact, in talking to some health staff, they, you know, they've said to me, what we don't want to do is um, a misstep, you know, instead of barriers to innovation. And in some respects, I wish they would be looking at it slightly differently, which is how do we create, um, you know, the environment to advance all this innovation? But they're loath to jump in sort of as all this dynamic change is taking place and create, you know, sort of um, barriers where there shouldn't be barriers or make it more difficult for you, you know, out there to do, you know, all the excellent things you are doing, so. Yeah, it's a good point. There's so many of these laws have their, their roots in, in a legacy legislation that was written way before these times. Like, there, there's a lot of debate around FERPA. You know, I know the House has sort of toyed with doing a complete overhaul of FERPA, because when that was written, there were, no, there were no cell phones, much less the computers that we kind of have now. And so it's just, it's hard to sort of tinker around uh, the edges with some of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, what about, so building up, you mentioned income share agreements. So is this an area of common? It, it seems like I know the, the Obama administration did some work there. It sounds like the Trump administration wants to do some work. Um, you hear a lot of different people saying this is a, an innovative mechanism for everything from code academies to higher education, helps with skin in a game and aligning incentives. Do you, do you think we'll see some action there, either regulatory or with uh, HEA? There's pending legislation. I think, John, you're, you're a, as a former White House education advisor, and we've, we have former Hill staffers and, 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 and soon-to-be governors that probably have a better perspective on, on in terms of forecasting what's likely to happen politically. Um, it, it does. It does feel like. Uh, uh, student finance is an area where there is mounting pressure, right? Where there's, where there's public commentary, there was, there was pressure on both sides of the aisle, in the far left and the far right. I mean, so, so, so college, college cost is, is an area where, um, where I think we do have mounting pressure. Um, and I, I think reconciling this, 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 this challenge we have around college cost, which in, which in, which in, in, in um, in, in, in part reflects loan forgiveness and other policies that have been in place since, since you know, prior to the Obama administration. Um, you know, there, there are areas where we have pressure, and yet at the same time, I feel this sense of, of um, you know, in, in some ways that we should, we should take a, a more hands-off approach. Um, you know, the, the college cost thing is fascinating, right? And, you know, I know I'm the lone college president here, so I've kind of got to defend the cost thing. Um, but I can't defend it, right? Because I think the amount of money that's being charged students is reprehensible. <clears throat> but I also think we have to look at how exactly we got there, right? So it's an arms race on our college campuses. If you don't have nice dorms, it's gonna hurt your enrollment. If you don't have amenities, it's gonna hurt your enrollment. I mean, when we went to college, well, some of us, I think you probably went a different time than I went. Um, but like the, you didn't have Pizza Hut and Chick-fil-A <laughs> as dining options, right? It was the school cafeteria or you ate off campus, That's right. right? So all those things cost. And <clears throat> you wanna have nice athletic teams. You wanna have, Great venues, all these things cost. So then when you stop and you say, well, what are we willing to do without, right?
Because the little known secret is it all comes on the back of student fees, mm -hmm. right? Or not all of it, but a good chunk of it comes on the back of student fees. Now, we cut tuition and fees by $10,000, right? We said, you know what? It's unconscionable for our students to rack up this amount of debt. But when we did so, we sat down with the students and said, listen, we can get these costs down, but you have to be okay with doing without certain things. And you know, that's a calculated risk you take. But maybe that's an easier risk when you're not dealing with the sons and daughters of people who have grown up in wealth and privilege, right? And you, I mean, that's a different set of concerns. We're gonna have to do something with costs, but the reality of it is, there are gonna be a segment of schools over here that can charge whatever they wanna charge, right? Because people are gonna go, right? My three alma maters, all are three of the most expensive schools in the country, right? And you know what? They don't have to change because people are lining up to go to school there. Where it affects you is as you come down the line. And that's where when you have these arguments about mat mismatching and things like that, that I think is particularly disingenuous is because everyone can't go here. Mm -hmm. Everyone's not gonna have the ability to go here. When you create that impression, that's not, that's not accurate, it's not correct. So yes, we have to deal with cost. There's, there's no way around it, it should be dealt with. Right? The student loan debt is out of control. Um, but there's also a segment of the student population that for them, the reason why they have higher debt than normal is because that was their family's first access to the capital markets. Right? Yep. For years, they had no access to funds. And so now they have it. And yes, it doesn't make sense to graduate with forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of undergrad debt. But if your family never had access to money before, and let's be honest, for many of us, we took student loans and used it to invest in vehicles that had a higher rate of return than the student loan did, yeah. right? Like, I mean, that's another secret. But we don't talk about those things, right? So we're having two different conversations, and you have to find a way to have one conversation that can serve more people. The, the part I would add to that on the public university side, you see a similar trend, which is we have this debate about folks who will say in the same breath, yes, we, see, we want to see a reduction in the size of government, but we're sick and tired of seeing my kid's tuition rate go up every year at University of Colorado. And what we found is, so Colorado is unique in the 50 states. We have a constitutional measure called the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, which restricts state spending year over year every year. So what we've done, a lot of states have done, is if you look at 30 years ago, uh, at a public university in Colorado, the state, funded 70% of the total cost of that student's education. Right. And we asked the parents to cover 30%. If you look at what we've done now with budget cuts over the last 25 years at the state level, higher ed's always the first place you gotta cut because you don't have to release prisoners to do it. You don't gotta kick kids out of kindergarten. Right. You don't gotta stop giving right. health care, But you can raise higher ed costs. So what we've done is now, 30 years later, 70% of the total cost of a kid's college education is now borne by the parents. Right. Only 30% is borne by the state. So if you're wondering why you're getting 10% a year tuition increases in Colorado, it's not because the president of the University of Colorado is buying a yacht. It's because as you've cut back state funds more and more and more, what those universities have done to just survive, not to necessarily thrive, is to backfill with more parent tuition costs. So on the public side, there's another exactly version of that right. formula, which is you don't have to make public investments unless you're dissatisfied with either the roads and bridges you're getting or 35 kids in the kindergarten class or 10% increases in higher ed a year when your savings are generating 5% return. So we have parents who invested wisely when their kids were six and still couldn't keep up with those rate of tuition increases, and it wasn't their own fault. Right? Yeah, yeah, and this and this is where um, uh, uh, just just to um, tout Denver again, but there's this is a Denver-based startup called Guild, which is doing partnerships with companies like oh, yeah. Chipotle. Um, and, and when I refer to sort of the the how dynamic the market is today, this is this is in part what I'm thinking about, right? So the the college completion rates of working adults are are insanely low. It's like 20, 21 percent or something like that. Um, uh, very few people uh, have, have, have you know, four years of time and four years of money at the same time, or few, fewer and fewer people. This is, we see this in this sort of demographic trends with, with post-secondary education. So um, what, what, what companies like Guild are making, are, are making it possible for, for a, an individual to go to work at Chipotle when they're 18 years old and to graduate debt-free when they're 25 or 26, right? So they've got work experience and a degree and very little or no debt. 
um, that's that's really exciting, right? And it's um, and it's in some ways sort of it, it's found money, right? Like businesses are dealing with with uh, retention challenges, re retraining and rehiring employees. Colleges are dealing with a retention challenge with. Um, with, 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 with their students. So there are really interesting new models um, that bump up against tax policy as it relates to um, t tuition uh, reimbursement incentives for, for employers, which by the way haven't, haven't adjusted with either inflation or the, 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 the cost of, of college. Um, and so there are these really, there's some exciting new models that bump up against tax policy, you know, trade adjustment policy, John, which is an area where I know you've you focused a lot historically, but the, the, the how, when, and where of learning, what happens in, a, in, in, in the workplace, how does that experience articulate into um, uh, credit that's, that's, that's fungible and recognized by post-secondary institutions. Um, but there are these sort of nascent models that are, that are um, I think, give us reason to be optimistic. It seems like, I mean, we're coming, there are these huge tensions between uh, how do you make college more affordable and, and increase access uh, to students, particularly minority students, first generation students um, for college, but then also, you know, it's the affordability after uh, college too. The, the student loan debt, you know, is just, is something that was interesting to me sort of watching it is that more and more economists, uh, the New York Federal Reserve is just obsessed with it. And that's exactly the same pattern that kind of happened in healthcare. Like the moment it became not about Healthcare, but about costs and about budget, the economists sort of took it over. And I'm wondering if we're headed there in, uh, in higher education uh, because of some of the trends that uh, the senator was sort of talking about, sort of being pulling back. So what's, what do you think are some of the more promising solutions there? Is it, is it the federal government helping to sort of backstop and incentivize states to keep maintain their spending? Uh, is it reforming the student loan program? What's the, what's the best sort of path forward on this? So I think the Congress is looking at simplification, you know, one loan, one grant, you know, they're trying to uh, reduce the number of questions on the FAFSA. I mean, I do think it's been noted there's, a, there's an area here, it could, could happen in this Congress where there's, you know, some pressure to do something in this space. So I, you know, if you, if you listen to Chairman Alexander, he, he likes to talk about, well, Medicaid has grown, so, you know, the uh, higher, you know, money into higher education has, um, dropped off, et cetera. So you, you know, it's, it's always balancing all of these competing, you know, interests. But um, so, but I think it's it's an area where we could have some bipartisan uh, support. I think the key with legislation always is as soon as you start tweaking these policies, the score changes, and the score is like a, a big deal in the Congress. It's you know, is it is it adding to the deficit or is it? You know, is it budget neutral, et cetera? So every time you, you try to do anything in this space, so you really have to, the, the members of Congress are always looking at the score and, and, and how that impacts. And so that, it creates, it creates challenges for the Congress to get anything passed. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think we need to be more, you know, from a public policy standpoint, I think, you know, M M Michael, Michael sort of alluded, um, following my commentary on assessment to the fact that I, I, I'm optimistic, perhaps like bordering on Pollyannish, but the, um, uh, I, I think we need to take a more sector agnostic approach to how we tackle these problems. Um, I think, uh, again, I think that systems are in many ways broken, um, and, and, um, uh, but I think it's incumbent upon the people in, in this room, on the entrepreneurs and investors, to make more data-driven case for their ability to participate and their responsibility to play a, a public function. I think concomitant without a bigger push towards thinking about skills rather than thinking about degrees, which is how do you look at, because I think the return on investment for folks is going to be, if I'm in a job that I'm in now and I want access to a different job that is either more stable or more income, what skills do I have now, what skills do I need to be ready for that job, and how do I close the gap from where I am to where I want to go, uh, and how do we mean that might be two or three courses at Paul Quinn, it might be three or four courses online, it might be a combination of a number of things that aren't necessarily like go back to community college for two years and get an associate's degree, because we're not sure that's clearly going to prepare you. I think there's been some loss of faith in folks who've gone down that road and say, I spent two years of my life and two years of tuition, and now I don't have any more marketable skills for a career that I did two years ago, so this whole higher ed thing is, is a lie. And I think what we have the chance to push for now is how do we more closely align the employers with the skills they need to the seekers and the skills they want, and then how do you curate a community in the middle where people can access that in a way that's most convenient to them? Yeah. And when you and when you do that, right, 
then how do you measure institutional success? Yeah. Right? Because you're going to have to look at graduation rates in an entirely different perspective. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to look at the deliverables in a completely different perspective. And that's, that's where it starts to get, I mean, I, I think that's exciting. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, and again, I, don't, I really admire Michael, so as, as, the, as the resident university president, I hope he's not offended by this, but um, the, um, like if you think about like trade adjustment, and, and I've looked at a lot of uh, grants, so this is money that, that, that goes to fund community, co community college and sort of workforce training programs, ostensibly to, to, to design programs uh, that um, create education and training capacity when individuals uh, you know, sort of sacrifice their personal good in exchange for the public good. You lose jobs because we change tax policy or trade policy or something to that effect. And, and what, 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 again, what's sort of fascinating about that is like, if you look at like a general assembly and what it, the time it takes them to get a new course online and how closely coupled that is um, with the instructors that they use, with the design of the curriculum, with real time workforce demands. And then you look at like the very best um, my wife is from the South, like the very best, like bless her heart, like, um, uh, you know, she can hear this too. Right. Um, this, is you know, this is recorded. Community colleges that are highly effective, that are, um, you know, they're creating, creating committees that go out to speak with local employers to try and understand what local employers want, to go back to work with committees, to design courses, to then develop courses, to hire people, to teach courses that may or may not have ever worked in the fields in which they're training people to work. So then maybe like if they're really fast, two or three years getting courses online, meaning, meaning they're begin not really online, brick and mortar courses, that they're then marketing to individuals who are pulling down federal tax uh, subsidies to cover marketing costs to enroll in those courses, to, to maybe enter the workforce five or six years after the grant was awarded, if they're on a really tight timeline in a world where we know that the shelf life of skills is just five years. So like, so that's more depressing than Pollyannish, but, but, but you know, this, is, this Listen, is the world we're living in. You are talking about what I think is one of the greatest flaws of higher education, right? And that is we are incredibly slow to respond to anything. Yeah. Right? And part of that is the, you know, part of that is just the way the system evolves, right? So, you know, if you are a faculty-driven entity, then, you know, faculty likes to debate, discuss, re-debate, discuss some more, then have a committee. Then, I mean, like, the whole process, is, and, and listen, this is not knocking them, right? Like, people find comfort in their systems, okay? But... You can't then call those things innovative, right? I mean, it's not the case. So one of the things that, you know, I'm on record as being a big proponent of not having tenure, right? And not because I think academic freedom is bad. I think you protect academic freedom with everything you have. I don't think you should play a role in what teachers are teaching in their courses. But this is a different day. Right? So there are some economic concerns. There's some agility concerns that you have. And we need an environment where you can respond to the rapidly changing market. And, and you know, there's this discussion about, well, are the liberal arts outdated? I mean, you're never going to be outdated if you're taught how to think. Right? Like, that, that's timeless. That's ageless. But, but people need to know, like, you need to draw the line for them. You do this, you get this job, right? When you're dealing with over 50% of our students now coming out of public K-12 education on free and reduced lunches, if you think that you don't have to have a conversation about where you're going to get a job and how you're going to get a job, that is sadly mistaken. But you've got to be able to do that in a way where you're not two generations in before the change actually takes place. And if we don't address that, because to me, I mean, what I hear is people are angry with our industry mm -hmm. because they don't feel as if we've responded in a way that gives them any confidence that we hear them, which is how we wound up in the situation we're in now, you know, trying my best to be bipartisan here, <laughs> right? Um, but if you don't listen to people, if you don't respond to their concerns, then you will have to respond to their anger. And this is what we're saying. And I just, I mean, we're trying to do that at Paul Quinn. We've built a 
a model where we can go from concept to implementation incredibly fast, but it still might not be fast enough. And that's a burden that we have to live with. Okay, we need to clone you. No. <laughs> There's a new proposal. <laughs> I think that's also part of the legacy institution of higher education, right? Which is for 250 years, it was ultimately not a skills training organization, it was a branding entity. It was a sorting and branding function where it didn't matter how well your skills aligned with the workforce needed. What you knew is if Yale branded a kid with a Yale degree, McKinsey would accept that signal, and they didn't care if it was art history or biology or 17th century French no, literature. That's still true. Uh, right, so that there is still a degree to which right. that still functions, but farther down the line, as the branding gets less right. clear, that's now right. the question is, what do we actually think this degree means? And if it doesn't mean it clearly aligns to skills that I want, and the great disruptive example of that is technology, right? Like a CS degree from a given university may not be better than some performance ability to show what skills you actually have to be able to code. And so if those skills now trump the power of the brand to be able to show what someone has, then you have a system that's gonna force higher ed to say, okay, how do we both still have a branding function but also have a skills function? And for kids who are more worried about what the next job is and about what the power of the brand is, that skills function may start to dominate. And, and I just want to add one last thing to, to this point. We are having a conversation among ourselves, right? There is a significant number of institutions and students who don't care what we're talking about right. up here, right? They care about something much, much different. Their concerns are something that are much, much different. And by the time it gets to them, one could argue it might not matter, yeah. right? I mean, they're living in conditions that these are conversations that they can't afford to have, mm. right? And I think we have to be mindful of that as well. It goes, it goes back, by the way, sorry to put Allison on the spot, but it goes back to this issue of, of incorporating consumer data into our, right. into our right. decision making, right? right? So, um, and one of the striking things I've seen in, in the data is, which, which isn't terribly surprising, like we know that the you know, students, or young person's sort of economic mobility is predicated on the educational attainment of the mother. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you ask people where they, wh wh what's the number one source of information on post-secondary? Friends and family. Friends and family. Not right. websites, no. not guidebooks. That's exactly right. Friends and family. Friends and family. Mm -hmm. So that's, you have to figure out how to break okay. those cycles. And I think, well, and I just, I mean, maybe picking up on that a little bit and taking the conversation in a different direction, some of the data that will be revealed in a couple of weeks, the high line is, you know, we asked U.S. adults um, that had some, you know, some college and no degree or had a post-secondary credential, if you had the opportunity to do it all over again, would you attend the same institution? Would you earn the same, would you study in the same program um, and select the same major? and 50% of those who responded indicated that they would make a different choice wow. if they had the opportunity to do it over again. So I think going back to even the earlier discussion around price and cost and investment that students and families are making, um, you know, when they look back and they reflect on the choices they've made and the money they've spent or the time they've spent, um, we have a real opportunity to catch them earlier, catch them on the front end, catch them in elementary and secondary school to begin talking to them, not only about their post-secondary choices, but about the things that they want to do in their life and career and how all of that aligns. Yeah. You know, this My all mom back. always sort of thought the philosophy degree wasn't a great idea either, so yeah. that's true. Well, you might have politics. <laughs> <laughs> this ties back a little bit to, you know, Michael Moe last night was talking about the, um, we need to continuously fill up your knowledge tank, right? And yeah. it's, um, uh, because like higher education, you know, K-12 and then higher education is really just sort of a starting point. And, and you know, to the center's point, technology is going to keep disrupting occupations. Forces of globalization are going to sweep in, and, and we're going to be faced with people that need to kind of reskill or upskill, and we don't have great sort of ecosystems uh, for that quite yet. And, and I, I wonder if that's going to be an area of uh, to galvanize some bipartisan support, just kind of looking at this this uh, oncoming wave of automation that's going to happen with uh, autonomous driving trucks, replacing truck drivers. Um, you're, you're seeing sort of kiosks replacing a lot of service workers. You know, uh, Michael Moe last night highlighted it just all these retail workers that are sort of being put out. And there's a huge reskilling challenge that we as a country have to face. And yeah, but how are you gonna reskill people who were marginally skilled in the first, first place? place? 
right? I mean, so like, I see this as an ultimate in a class issue, right? So those individuals that go to elite schools are still going to go to elite schools. They're still going to be OK. They're going to form the companies that own the artificial intelligence and the automated. Like, they're going to be fine, right? Then there's going to be a group that is in the middle, right? They call it middle class. And they're going to shrink quickly, right? And they're not going to shrink because they're going up. They're going to shrink because they're going down. And so the bottom, this, this group of individuals who have lived with economic insecurity, who have lived with under, um, being underutilized by the job market, they're going to struggle. And we don't have an answer for that, right? Like I was tweeting about that this afternoon. It was just like, what are we going to do with all the jobs that artificial intelligence right. you know, cancels out, right? How are you going to have that conversation? Who speaks for them? I think it's great that we have these things, right? But don't we also have an obligation to use them for those who are going to be displaced? And we're not having that conversation. And I think that's irresponsible. And I think that's a place where higher education can really participate. And I'd like to see us participate because we're going to need to address that issue. It's interesting. It's a, it's a gap. The time I've spent in Silicon Valley, the, the CEOs there are obsessed about this. Like, they're really concerned. They, they, they see the way of coming. I don't know if that same sort of sense of urgency is felt in D.C. Like, I still think a lot of policymakers see that's on the way horizon, right? But uh, last night, we all saw that demo of the echo with the pictures. Like, it's much, much closer than I think people, people think it is. So, well, I was just going to say, I mean, in terms of policymakers, you know, my experience, and this was 15 years ago, but when we were talking about the advent of distance education yeah. and online learning, and with all due respect to the members of Congress who were sitting on the dais, that, that had not been their experience, right? And so trying to educate them on the transformation in the education system and bring them along to, a, to think about a new approach and a new technology when you were talking about distance education and in their minds we're thinking about correspondence courses, right? And so you know, we right. have to be right. really sensitive to how we're talking about these issues and innovations and bringing policymakers along just as we're bringing you know, new communities of stakeholders along. Allison is so right. I mean, you know, even now you could go to the Hill and someone would be like, well, we're not really sure online you know, education works. When, when look at what's happening all across the country. So, you, you know, and they can hold up some study that was done at some point. So you, I think you're right. I think sometimes the, there's a disconnect, unfortunately, with, you know, sort of the policymakers that have the pen on the legislation and, and uh, what's actually happening, out, you know, out here in the real world. Okay, so lightning round, and then we'll finish this off. But uh, the secretary said that you know she's she wants to to be in partnership with so many of the innovators and, uh, and and policy leaders here. So what is what is one piece of advice or hope that you would have uh, for her and for Congress in terms of education policy? It could be higher education, K twelve. One thing you'd like to see them do. I mean, I can jump in. Um, we believe in the power of the work college format, right? This idea that students work while they're going to school and they use that to manage the cost of tuition and fees so they keep the cost down, the student, let that, the student loans down. And they also get a work transcript and an academic transcript, which explains the skills that they've acquired. But it, it, it's pre our version of it at Paul Quinn is an urban version, which is pre-professional training. So our students are going out working in corporations and not-for-profits, and those companies are helping to keep the costs low. So I'd like to see legislation and policies that make it easier for institutions to, be, to transform themselves into work colleges. Great. Lauren? So, you know, I'm going to think uh, 
a lot of it is TBD, and I, you know, my focus, of course, is more in the sort of how to help clients sort of navigate the political landscape as opposed to sort of, you know, practitioners sort of working. But I would just say this, you know, having had the opportunity to volunteer on the transition and work with Betsy DeVos, she's very much an entrepreneur at heart, and I think what she said today um, is, is very real to her. She really believes that what is going on um, here in Silicon Valley, et cetera, this innovation, we somehow need to make it work for kids um, in, in a different way. She really does look at the kids as unique. And she said over and over in the time that I spent with her, it is 2017 people. You know, we, you know if, if a school is not meeting the needs of a child, that parent needs to have the opportunity to move that child somewhere so that you know, we don't lose that child. Um, and so she feels very strongly about it. So I, I have faith in that, you know, her entrepreneurial spirit, she, her work ethic, um, her, she's laboratory minded. She's worked a lot in the states. And so I think she's very, um, she's going to be looking for certain things in these state plans as they're coming in. Um, and hopefully there'll be enforcement as well, uh, on, you know, in the background. So when these plans, you know, get implemented, then there'll be enforcement as well to make sure that everybody's doing what they said they were doing on behalf of kids. So for me, um, a former boss always used to say, some days we do politics and some days we do policy. And it's very rare that the two actually ever come together um, and allow us to do something really impactful. So as I think about this administration and the opportunity that they have something that they have to do, um, something really impactful is to actually find a way to integrate politics and policy um, and, and really move the needle for kids in this country. I think we need to keep an open, uh, a really open mind at this point. I think we have a lot of, again, I'm sort of Pollyannish about it. I think we have a tremendous amount of, of potential for policy flexibility. I think there's profound risk in that, and there's profound, and there's profound opportunity. Um, and the market is, in, again, in, in, in tremendous flux. So I, I guess I would say that the I think the worst thing we can do at this point is sort of calcify around norms that probably don't really exist yet. Um, and, 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 and retain a degree of flexibility? I think the two things would be, one is like, use the innovation entrepreneurship out there in the environment right now to help us figure out what works better and drive resources towards those. So for instance, instead of zeroing out all $1.2 billion of teacher and principal professional development, let's say, all right, we know some version of the old model that doesn't generate outcomes. We do know there are innovative new things being done that will change practices. How do we invest in and grow those practices that are actually working? I think that matters a ton. And I also, I'm going to talk about this some in my talk later, but I think, I do think there's a great opportunity given the focus on the economy to think about what are we going to do, to Michael's point, to actually help prepare people for the economic changes that are coming. And how do we get ahead of this by not saying we're going to turn back the clock to an economy of the 1970s, but to say we know that disruption is coming to multiple industries. And so how do we think about what we're doing with the coal miner now, and we know that we're closing that plant 18 months from now to figure out what, is, what are the skills he needs to get from where he is now to where he wants to go, and how are we going to help build infrastructure at the state level and among a sort of group of skills providers that include colleges and community colleges and higher ed and also include nonprofit entrepreneurs like Guild and the Galvanizes to help folks get there. I think building a real infrastructure, and I think the states be the first to do it, but helping us find a way to build that is going to help us all get ahead of the, I think, the frustration people are feeling now. Great. Will you join me in thanking the panel? And, and, uh, great. Just special thanks to you, too, for hanging in there. So I know it's late in the day. So. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. <laughs>